So, France is having a lot of different problems all at the same time. They are spending themselves into oblivion. Their economy is crumbling. They have a social system that no one likes except for a very few. And King Louis the Sixteenth, he's aware of these problems. You know, he's not he's not completely ignorant. We often paint paint the aristocracy of France at this time as just kind of vapid, not really knowing what's going on. He's aware of the financial problems, though. And because he's aware, he actually he asks for help. So in 1789, he calls a parliament together. It's called the Estates General. He calls this assembly to come together to help each other and help him figure out what to do, how to fix these problems. The last time the Estates General had been called was in 1626. <laughs> so over 100 years in, before, between. So for the Estates General, representatives from all three estates gathered together. The first estate gets 303 representatives. I think I would have memorized these numbers by now. The second estate gets 282 representatives. And the third estate, I just looked at it, why do I always forget? The third estate gets 578 representatives. Now it sounds like a lot, but if you add these two together, they still outnumber. <laughs> but these delegates, they come together, they start meeting on May 5th, 1789. And the king is there presiding. And we're all going to come together. We're going to figure out how to find a solution to this. Figure out what, how to fix it. And they start having their meeting on May 5th, 1789. And they start shouting at each other. They start screaming. They start threatening each other. They start pounding on the table. How dare you, sir, suggest that? No, you, sir, how dare you? No, you. And you, and you, and you. And they shout, and they scream, and they pound the table for 23 days. Whoa. <laughs> they meet for three weeks. Anyone want to guess how many decisions they came to? <laughs> Zero. They came to no decisions. Now here's the funny part. How many issues do you think they talked? All the, all the issues. <laughs> so Alex, how many? Just one. They talked about one issue for 23 days. Anyone want to take a guess what that issue was? Debt. Not the debt. Yes. The bread. Not the bread. I bet you won't guess it. Yes. Spending. Not spending. Not, yeah. Not the military, not the spending, not the debt, it, not not even this class system itself. They argued for twenty three days about how to vote. Oh my God! <laughs> twenty three days of shouting and threats and pounding on the table. And they could not come to a decision about how to vote. <laughs> no, they knew how. So they had two options. They could vote by order. So if you vote by order, that means the first estate gets one vote. The second estate gets one vote. The third estate gets one vote. Yes? How do you vote? How do you vote this? Yeah, that's true. I, I don't know. That, that goes into like parliamentary rules. But that's a funny. That's a funny point to make. <laughs> but that, that was the first decision that they had to come to, and they they couldn't. So they could vote by order, which is where each estate gets one vote each. And who would that benefit? 
the top two, why? Well, they can come to their own unanimous decision. Because they're best friends. Because they're BFFs. Forever. So they're going to always team up yeah. to push this guy around. So this would benefit the first and second. The other way they could have voted is vote by delegate. So instead of the entire group voting one way, each individual person gets their own vote. Sounds fair. Who would benefit from that? The third. The third estate would benefit because is everyone in the second estate going to agree? No. No. So they're probably going to, some of them are going to vote down here. So this would actually benefit the third. Sorry, the benefit three. Does that make sense? Yeah. But they could not come to a decision at all. And so finally, the third estate said, whatever, screw this. We're going across the street, and we're going to make our own assembly. It's going to be a thousand times better than this stupid one. If you want to come along, we're going to be at the tennis courts. We're going to hang out, and we're going to, we're going to fix these problems. So they're openly defying the king. Because the king is the one that called this parliament. Can you imagine from his perspective? Like, you can't do that. This is the only parliament. You can't just go make your own. Imagine, <laughs> imagine in like our modern context, if like the Democrats got so upset with Donald Trump they said, you know what? We're, we're leaving Congress. <laughs> this Congress is not official anymore. We're going to make our own Congress across the street. And we're going to figure things out. So they meet across the street in the tennis courts, and no one from the first or second joins them. It's only the third. And the, the National Assembly then passes the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. Which basically, and you're going to read this next week, um, which basically lays out what the rights of a Frenchman are and what the duties of government are. And it's a direct attack on monarchy itself. Does anyone need this stuff? So things are simmering. Have you ever had a pot of boiling water? You have a lid on top? Can you just leave it alone? No. no. Well, what's going to happen if you just leave it alone? You have to be careful when you're boiling water. So think of French France right now as that pot of water. And is anyone watching it? No. It's just bubbling and bubbling and simmering, and there's violence right around the corner, and it's almost like you could taste it in the air. Everyone feels it. There's people walking around the streets. Um, you know, a lot of them are unemployed. A lot of them can't feed their families. A lot of them are hungry, and all of them are very, very angry. And this is kind of going through, the, and there's, there's protests, there's clashes with the police, there's clashes with the army. Meanwhile, the third estate has just left the assembly and making their own. So everyone can kind of feel that something is about to happen. But they don't know when or where or what it will be. Turns out that it will happen on July 14th. And the event will be the Bastille being attacked. The Bastille is a prison. It's also a fort, but it's primarily used as a prison. <coughs> so lots of murderers and rapists and thieves. Bad people, generally. But there is a rumor that goes around that says that there are political prisoners being held there. So there's a rumor going around that the king has basically thrown innocent people in jail just because he disagrees with them. 
and they're being held here at the Bastille. And this rumor spreads all over Paris, all over France, and thousands of people start gathering around the Bastille, hungry people, angry people. And they start shouting at the guards, how dare you keep innocent people in here? How dare you call yourself a man? Oh, you're, you're just fighting for the fat cats. Thousands of people shouting, angry. Imagine being one of those guards. <laughs> There's people coming from everywhere. I don't know what to do. And then people start getting closer and closer to the gate. They start jostling with the guards. They start getting in the guards' faces. Like, what are you going to do, huh? And people start throwing punches. And then people, you know, some of the guards get hit in the head, and, the, and people are throwing rocks, and what are the guards going to do? Shoot. Guards start firing into the crowd. People get killed. What's the crowd going to do? Beat They're going to get even angrier, and they start surging forward. How dare you? And they start beating the crap out of these guards with sticks and bricks. And you know, once you take down a guard, what can you then do with their gun? Take their gun. Take their gun. And so they start fighting the other guards and they start bayoneting people. And then they finally break down the gate and they go through the prison. They're still fighting with the guards. And they start opening up all the cells. You're free! You're free! Get out of here! And the Bastille falls and the guards eventually, oh my gosh, stop, stop. Some of them run away. Some of them actually join with the riot. <laughs> I mean, why not? <laughs> no, there, there's a reason. Because, you know, I mean, think about the situation. Like, these guards are probably just normal guys, you know? They're just doing a job. And do they really want to fire into a crowd of people? No. no. So they overthrow the Bastille. They let all the prisoners out. However, it turns out that the rumor was not true. There were none. There were no political prisoners there, which means they just let out a bunch of murderers and rapists and thieves. Be free! Viva la revolution! Not a good decision. But they did find something in the Bastille that was even more important than political prisoners. Anyone want to take a guess? Yeah. Weapons. Weapons an armory, a fully stocked military grade armory was in the Bastille with weapons and ammo and gunpowder, muskets and pistols and swords and spears. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> so now you have a crowd of very angry, very hungry people and now they have weapons. Is that a very good recipe? No. Well, <laughs> I guess it depends on who you ask. <laughs> but for the king, is it a good recipe? No, certainly not. Any questions? So the revolution, Bastille Day is really the mark this, the revolution is on. No more talking. No more negotiation. Gloves are off. We are full. Th we are going to overthrow the king. And there's a lot of reasons why people are doing this. Um, you know, there's the basic reasons that people are upset about the social structure. People are, are hungry. There's the economic problems. But there are bigger picture issues that they're they're fighting for. So let's talk a little bit about the principles that these people are fighting for. One of the things that the revolutionaries want to do is abolish serfdom. So this system, of, this class system where you have lords and ladies that, con that own and control these vast uh, plots of land. And if you're a peasant born here, you're tied to the land and you're not allowed to leave. And Are you allowed to go up in the social structure? No. no. If you're born a peasant, you're going to die a peasant. And so the, the French revolutionaries want to get rid of that. They're also fighting for equality for men. Eventually, women will be included in this, but right now, it's only men. And they also want to end aristocratic privilege. Yeah. Um, are there other like are there people from 
different places here, like... Um, like a tourist? <laughs> <laughs> well, li like people from other countries here? I'm are, certain there yeah, were. So are they being included in all these women? Oh, I don't know. Um, Probably. But I don't think any of them are really participating in the whole thing. I mean, like, imagine you're on vacation somewhere and then there's a revolution. That's actually a terrifying thought. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like that idea. So they want to end aristocratic privilege. So we're not going to call you a lord. We're not going to call you a lady anymore. Just because your daddy was rich doesn't mean you're better than me. You're just going to be a citizen like anyone else. And guess what? You don't just get a monopoly on the government. We also want to end church privilege. Similar thing. Just because you're a priest doesn't mean I'm going to bow and scrape for you anymore. And also, guess what? You're going to start paying taxes like everyone else. And, of course, they want an elective parliament. So they want a democracy. They want uh, a legislative body that is chosen by the people themselves. Ultimately, though, all of these principles could be summarized by one slogan. And it's the most famous slogan from the revolution. And I apologize, I did not take French, so if I misspell this, please let me know. Liberté! Egalité, fraternité, liberté, in English means what? Liberty. Liberty. He's busy. How about egalité? Equality. Equality. And fraternité? Fraternity. Oh, good. Good. Fraternity, also known as brotherhood. So they're not saying that they have a right to be in a frat, just to be clear. <laughs> I have a right to be a frat, bro! <laughs> Delta Sort! <laughs> no, it's brotherhood. <laughs> no, my wife was in a sorority, though, so I'm allowed to make fun of her. <laughs> Lots of bad decisions in, in Greek life. <laughs> Has anyone, has anyone seen Neighbors? Yeah. That's such a funny movie. <laughs> I went and saw that with my wife when it first came out. It's about a, a frat that moves in right next door to this couple, and they have like a, a brand new baby, and it's just their, the conflict between them. Definitely not school appropriate, but pretty funny anyway. Any questions? So... The revolution is in full swing, and they start going after what they perceive to be their enemies. For instance, they start targeting the church. They start targeting the clergy. Mobs of people going through the streets, and if they find a priest, they beat him with sticks or bricks. People are actually killed, beaten to death, shot, stabbed, because they're a priest. Yeah. Are people still religious? Clarify. Um, do they still do they still like believe in God? Do they still want to like just while this church? craziness is going on? Yeah. That's a great question. I don't know how to answer that question. Um, here, let me continue my spiel, and I'll let you decide for yourself. Okay. Um, at the very least, the people who are like really leading the revolution are not. Uh, the people who are leading the revolution are basically atheists, and maybe we'll see we'll see what they do to the to the the churches. So there are forty thousand churches in France. Almost every single one of them is closed, shut down, not allowed to do mass, not allowed to do just normal services, not allowed to celebrate Easter, nothing. Basically, just the entire country is essentially shut off from religious experience. They go into, the revolutionaries, they storm into Notre Dame. Yes, is that correct? Yes, it's correct. 
they storm into Notre Dame and they, they have these thick, heavy ropes with them. And they, they go to the altar where there's this large crucifix there. And they throw the rope over the crucifix. They tear down the crucifix. They drag it across the ground and they throw it out into the street. Why is that offensive to Christians? <laughs> but no, for real, why? Because that's what Satan their sins. Uh, clarify. Expand on that. Jesus was like crucified on the cross to save the sins of humanity. Yes, according to the Christians. Yeah. So, the crucifix itself is a, an incredibly holy symbol for Christians because of the reason that you just gave. And so that is deeply offensive, what they just did. They also then renamed Notre Dame to the Temple of Reason. Why isn't it called that today? <laughs> well, We'll get into that in the next lecture. <laughs> um, they call it the Temple of Reason, and they actually start worshiping reason, which is kind of weird and abstract. And this is just what they do to the Notre Dame. In other churches, uh, the revolutionaries take bricks and they smash the windows. There are some churches that they just burn to the ground straight. But in Notre Dame, at least, thank goodness, they left it alone, <laughs> except for the crucifix. But otherwise, they turn it into the temple of reason. Yes. But then it did eventually I know. burn. I know. It's so sad. <laughs> so very sad. Um, yes. So, were they more Catholic or more Christian? Like, well, Catholics are Christian. They are. Well, it's <laughs> just a different branch of Christianity. Is that Catholic? Okay, so wait, hold on, hold on. So there are many branches of Christianity. Yeah. All that it takes to be a Christian is that you believe in Jesus, basically. Okay. But Christ, uh, there's differences between Catholicism and like Protestantism or, or Lutheranism. We don't have time to go into those details. Point is, uh, Catholics are Christian, so they were predominantly Christians. Oh. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But now the revolutionaries are basically smashing the entire institution of the church. Another way that they attack the church is they set up the Republican calendar. A brand new calendar that has a 10 day week. And they make the year 1789 the year zero. Let's break this down just real quick. Why is setting up a 10 day week an attack on Christianity. Because the day is only seven. Oh, say again, no. Because the day is only seven. And it's like seven days we can have each day. Uh, you're so close. You're so close. Yeah, Richard. Yeah, please believe that the earth was made in seven days. So good. So many, according to the Bible, the earth was made in six days. And then on the seventh day, God rested. Which is why Jews rest and they worship and they go to synagogue on Saturday and Christians go when? Sunday. Sunday. Can you know when Sunday is in a 10 day week? No. no, unless you like really like you keep track of every single one but will you be able to do that over time? No, so a 10 day week is a direct attack at Christianity. How about this one? Why is that offensive to Christians? The first year. Yeah, Richard. The year Jesus was born. Was when? Year zero. We're zero. So 1789, we're counting up from what? From the birth. Yes, okay, thank you. And if you set it to zero, what are you basically saying? The birth of, is the birth of Jesus is not important. We are in a new age, the age of reason, the age of the French Revolution. Now, to be fair, though, they only used this calendar for like five years, and then they went back to using <laughs> the calendar beforehand. But there's reasons for that. We'll get to that later. So the church is being very directly attacked. They go, the revolutionaries are going around, and they're capturing priests. And when they capture priests, you know, sometimes they just beat them up. Other times they say, okay, you have three options. One, you can leave the country. Two, you can stop being Christian. Three, you can die. And 20,000 priests
20,000 priests flee for their lives. They go to Italy, they go to Germany, they go to England, they go to other, colon other, other French colonies. Basically a huge wave of priests as refugees. 6,000 priests decide to give up being a priest and they actually get married. Actually, they're forced to get married. Can you be a priest if you're married? Yeah. No. no. Can you ever be a priest again if you get married? No. No. And thousands more are executed by the revolutionaries. Thousands are forced to flee from their homes. Dozens of churches are burned to the ground. Many of them have their windows smashed with bricks. Well, they were about 1% of the population. The other group, what other group are the revolutionaries attacking? Nobility. The nobility. The aristocracy, it kind of becomes a sport for the revolutionaries to hunt down the aristocracy. Because, I mean, there's only 400 of them, so they're pretty rare. And so, you know, same thing, similar thing with the priests. If you're an aristocrat and you're just like walking down the street, a mob of people might show up and just beat you to death with bricks. And eventually it gets to the point where aristocrats are trying to escape, get out of the country, and so they try to dress like, you know, normally. <laughs> they try to hide, like have a hat, and go, oh no, sneak out. And then people will say, I know him, he's a, he's a baron, oh no, and then you run away, and get beat up. It becomes kind of a hysteria where people are hunting for these, these aristocrats. It gets to the point where they start uh, targeting people who aren't aristocrats. Like, I know him. He's a duke. I know him. Like, I'm a banker. I don't, or I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a librarian. Leave me alone. Oh. <laughs> it becomes a really bad problem for the aristocrats. Uh, the king of France's son was being sent out of the country. They put him in a carriage and said, okay, this stuff is getting crazy. You need to leave. And he was in this carriage going down the road when it was stopped by a group of revolutionaries. And they forced the kid out. He's like eight years old, nine years old. And he said, I know you. You're the prince. And so they beat him with a stick to the point that he had brain damage. And then he spent the rest of his life in an orphanage, not being fully cognizant of what was going on. Yeah? Um, what are we supposed to be writing for one? Basically, all the stuff that I've been talking about. Anyway. Meanwhile, you know, the Pope is also saying, like, oh my gosh, everything is going crazy. We need, we need to batten down the hatches. Uh, the military. The military starts off on whose side? Aristocrats, right? Yeah, on the aristocrats. They work for the king. That, that's who pays them. So they start off on, on the... On the king's side, but as time is going on and as, as the revolution is growing in numbers and more and more people are confronting people, you know, there's battles going on in the streets. There's these riots going on all throughout Paris. And you can't, you got to imagine what it's like being one of these soldiers. I mean, they're just like a normal person. You know, if, if they weren't wearing a uniform, which class would they be in? It's the third estate. And they're being told by their officers, fire into the crowd. Do they want to? No. no. And so increasingly, especially as the t scales start tipping, many of the soldiers start either putting their weapons down and walking away, or they might even join with the revolutionaries. And if you're the king of France and your army is starting to join the other side, how much longer do you have? Not much, Not much longer. Now I add to this. Is France the only country in Europe? No. no. So there's all sorts of other countries around them watching this going on. Like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. You got the Spanish, you got the Portuguese, the English, the Prussians, the Italians, so on and so forth. And a lot of these places, they're monarchies as well, right? And they're watching the peasants in, in France rise up, smash the states, smash the government, attack the aristocracy. How would that make... A, a British aristocrat feel. 
uneasy, what might they do? <laughs> oh, okay, so you're going for a more positive approach. <laughs> Say again? Well, so we're in England. Is there a revolution going on in England? No, but next door, there's a revolution going on. Strengthen your power. Would you try to stop that revolution? Yes. So if the revolution spreads, it could spread to your country and overthrow you. So France gets invaded by like six different countries all at the same time. Spain, the British, the Prussians, the Austrians, they're basically all dogpiling onto France saying, stop, stop the revolution, stop it now. Because they are so afraid of it spreading and then their own peasants overthrowing them. It's an immensely destabilizing event. <coughs> okay. Whew. Any questions? Don't worry, we're almost done for the day. Now it's hard to it's hard to imagine like exactly what their response was. Um, by this next slide, I think really summarizes what the response of the king and the church and the aristocracy and the nobility and all of them. I think this really summarizes their response to all of this going on. No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 <laughs> They are very worried about all of the chaos going on. Last call. Any any questions? Yes. How much do you like the office? I really like the office. Um, my wife and I watch it a lot. We cycle through Frasier and Parks and Rec and The Office. But now that The Office is being taken off in like a year, <laughs> gotta gotta batten down the hatches. So yesterday. No, it was Tuesday with you guys. We were talking about the French Revolution, what caused, what led up to it, some of the factors that led up to it. And then we talked a bit about you know, how it started and what the revolutionaries started to do. Now we're going to just finish up with this revolutionary time period. We start to see a very radical shift. So the policies that the revolutionaries are pursuing become more radical. They're kind of shaking the society to its foundations. We talked a bit about that with how they were attacking the Catholic Church, how they were attacking traditional authority, you know, assaulting and beating up uh, um, the wealthy people, the aristocrats and things like that. But then they, they go even further. So one day, the king and queen, so Marie, Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI, they're sitting in their house, which is called Versailles. Um, if you've ever seen pictures of Versailles, it's a nice house. Very nice. Lots of gold, lots of marble, beautiful lawns with uh, you know, sculpted hedges and things like that. Fountains, beautiful home. If we remember, they spent about 25% of their entire budget, the entire country's budget, on just this house. So one day they're sitting in their home, and they hear shouting in the distance. And they look out the window, and coming up their driveway, basically, uh, coming up their driveway is a mob of angry peasants. And they start getting very, very worried looking at this. Oh dear, where are the guards? Guards, please help! The mob is coming! Guards, where are the guards? Oh no, are there any guards there? No. no. They're on their own. The guards left a while ago. And so the revolutionaries, the peasants, they kick open the door. They start rampaging through Versailles. They start stealing candlesticks and they smashing windows and stuff like that. And then they grab the king and queen. They drag them out of the house and into a carriage. And they take them back to Paris. And in the, when they're in the city, they are thrown in jail, thrown in prison for months on end. They're put on trial for crimes against the people, and they are sentenced to death. And then 
they execute King Louis XVI. The last king of France has his head chopped off with a guillotine. You all probably know what a guillotine is. You've probably seen it before. But the distinctive feat, yeah. Um, what happened to the queen? She also had her head chopped off um, after the game. No, that's cool. Man. So the distinctive, no, the same way. The distinctive thing about the guillotine is the triangular shape of the blade. And you can see it up here. So you put the person down, you lay them down with their head exposed over the basket. And then you use the rope, then you lift up the blade. And then very simple, you just let go. And then gravity does the rest. So as, what's interesting about the guillotine is that it's cur it's triangular for, in this way. So let's imagine. It's a fast thing. Like rolls off or something. Yeah. Hold on. I'm trying to draw a neck. Anyway, let's imagine. <laughs> <laughs> let's imagine it on me. So the point, the first part that's going to start cutting is over here. And then as it goes through, it cuts evenly across my neck, or across the neck. So it, it results in a clean cut and a quick one, which is a positive in a way, if you think about it. Uh, before they had the guillotine, how did they chop off people's heads? Like an axe. Well, they, actually, that's a mis misconception. So they did use axes sometimes, but it was mostly with swords. Oh, and the problem with swords oh. <laughs> is if you don't get the angle just right, if you don't have enough force with it, you're going to have to hit them like three or four times. Oh, oh my god. god. I, I read once it took like, for one person, it took like seven hits to get their head off. Can you imagine how awful that would be? That's terrible. Whereas with the guillotine, oh. it's, it's quick, nice and clean. So they cut off, they, and the, what they, when they did this, it was a huge crowd of people. It was out in the open, thousands of people. It was like, it was like a fair. People brought their kids. Mommy, Daddy, I want to see the king beheaded. Can I be on your shoulders while we watch? And they cut off, the, and the, uh, oh, sorry. So the crowd is shouting and, and yelling, kill him, kill him. And then they finally bring him out, and he's forced to walk up the steps all on his own while people are shouting, Kill the traitor! Kill the enemy of the people! They put him down, they cut off his head, and then, if you can see on the picture, they're holding his head up to the crowd. And when they do that, the crowd goes wild. Yeah! Throw his body to the crowd! Blood! Yes! And they do the same thing for the queen. They throw her head to the crowd as well. But what's interesting about the guillotine, though, is that it becomes a symbol of equality. <laughs> There's actually a very straightforward reason for this. After the, new, after the revolution, the new government of France makes a decision, and they say that if you're going to be executed, no matter who you are, you're going to be executed with the guillotine. So it doesn't matter if you are a poor beggar or the king of France. No matter who you are, you're going to be killed the same way. So that kind of is positive. Yeah. Do they have a flag with a guillotine on it then? Or? No. I don't know about that. But I do know that some people actually uh, they made little necklaces with a little tiny guillotine. And people will walk around with uh, guillotine necklaces and things like that. Mm. Yeah. How long did they use the guillotine? <laughs> was that? How long did they use the guillotine? <laughs> so the last person to be executed by guillotine was in the 1970s. <laughs> can you imagine that? There's actually pictures of it. We can look at it later if you want. Yeah. The last so person to be guillotined <laughs> to death. YouTube. So, Instagram. King's dead. Is the revolution over? No. no, of course not. We're just getting started. Many, many people were very afraid of what were called counter-revolutionaries. So maybe people that might undermine the revolution, people that might want to reverse the revolution or put the king back in charge. 
So in this case, it would be like people who might support the Catholic Church, people who, are, who believe in monarchy, people who are wealthier. Many of the revolutionaries were very worried that there were a concerted conspiracy to overthrow the, the revolution. So people started whispering, I think that person's a counter-revolutionary. I heard him whispering about how he thinks that the revolution is bad. Grab him, grab him now, counter-revolutionary, put him on trial, put him in the square, cut off his head. Yeah! They were also very, and this begins what is called the reign of terror, where thousands of people are arrested, accused of being counter-revolutionaries, accused of being spies, accused of being saboteurs, so people trying to sabotage things. And we have to remember also that France is being attacked by like seven different countries at the same time. So people are saying, I heard him saying something in English. He was writing something in English. He must be a British spy. Grab him, grab the traitor, throw him in the street, cut off his head. Ah! <laughs> and, but to be fair though, most of these people, were they actually counter-revolutionaries? No. Most of these people were just normal people. Same thing with the spies and the saboteurs. Most of them were just normal people. But when a crowd, when a mob really gets going, can't stop they, yeah, you can't really stop them. That mob mentality is very, very dangerous. And so they end up killing 17,000 people. <laughs> Holy crap. Cool. More blood. Throw the head to the crowd. And we also have to remember, every time they execute people, it's like an event. It's like a carnival or a fair where people bring their kids. Nice. Darling, would you like to take a stroll today? Maybe we'll go see the executions. Yes, darling, that sounds wonderful. Um, 17,000 Do they have like vendors at the executions? Probably. <laughs> I mean, why not? It's a lot of people there. Might as well make some money. No, Umbrellas, so you don't get blood on you. <laughs> that's a bit dark. I'm sorry, that's dark. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> when they executed people hundreds at a time in these huge events. And this was all being run by a guy named Maximilien de Robespierre. He was kind of the head of this revolutionary council. And he's the one that really started coming up with the idea of we should kill all of these people. Jeez. And he started making a list of names. Like this person, this person, this person. They're all counter-revolutionaries. Kill them. And then it turned out that some of the people on his list were political opponents of his. <laughs> so, hmm. But unfortunately for him, he was eventually also accused of counter-revolution. And so he was also executed. <laughs> He also had his head chopped off and thrown to the crowd. You can come with everything you saw from the street. <laughs> yeah. So the lesson here is don't chop off people's heads because you might end up with your head chopped off. This also comes to a, a critique that some historians have with these kind of revolutions. Uh, with the French and like the Russian, the Chinese, the Cuban. The critique is that the revolution ends up eating itself or eating their children that the people that led it ultimately get purged as well. So Robespierre, he was a key leader of the entire thing, and yet he got his head chopped off. Uh, in the Russian Revolution, Leon Trotsky was very, very important, and yet he also got stabbed in the head with an ice pick. Oh, yes. What about George Washington? Okay, so that's, that's where the critique is a bit flawed. Because the, we don't see that similar thing with the American Revolution. Exactly. But we see it with the French, we see it with the Russian, we see it with the Chinese, where the leaders of the revolution almost always end up getting <laughs> axed off as well. All right, any questions? So there's just, just chaos going on. And eventually people are, I mean, this goes on for like a year and a half, where they're cutting off people's heads in the street, like in the main square, like imagine at Wheeler Park, like at Town Hall, they just set up a guillotine. Oh, just every geez. day they just cut off people's heads and you can go and watch. Like that would be crazy. 
And so finally, after Robespierre gets axed, a more moderate government takes over. They're called the Directory. Let me write it up here. No one protested against the guillotine killing. Well, if you did. <laughs> oh. You're a you, how dare you? How dare you question revolutionary justice? Are you a counter-revolutionary? So a more moderate government called the Directory takes over, and they say, OK, everyone, let's take a chill pill. Let's calm down a little bit. Maybe we don't need to kill so many people. Maybe we could go back to the, like, the normal calendar that we were used to. Maybe, maybe Catholics aren't all evil. Maybe we could be a bit more tolerant. So after this, they very much calm down. Yeah. Did that moderate government last for a while? <laughs> no. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second, but I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. Another law, another thing that we really need to uh, be clear on, a long-term effect of the, of the revolution is a surge of nationalism. And if I were you, I would like underline this, and put stars around it, and highlight it. Nationalism is the watch word for this entire year. It's going to be super duper important for the rest of the year. So this common sense of identity really surges. Because now, now the king's gone. Now we have a republic. And so many people are saying, I'm not fighting for my king. I'm not fighting for my lord. I'm fighting for my country. I'm not just some peasant from Paris. I am a Frenchman. Well, at the same time, you know, they're being dogpiled by like seven different countries. And so there's that wartime sense of identity as well. All right. Any questions? No? Okay. Then let's end with some memes. Only 1700s <laughs> kids will remember this. Hashtag nostalgia. Hashtag better back then. <laughs> that one's dark. And then we got some more memes. Who would win? All of France or some choppy things? I think they should change that to some choppy boys. That would be pretty funny. So now the revolution, it depends on who you ask, but some historians make the argument that now the revolution is over. So are we going to be just calm and serene now? No. Who's going to take over France very soon? Who? Napoleon. Napoleon. Napoleon is right around the corner. That's our next lecture. I think of this as just kind of like the tease. Like at the end of the Marvel film, you know, you get the tease for the next one. So here's your teaser right here. And with that, we're done.